There's a saying that dead men don't tell tales, but that is not true. Dead people provide lots of information, not only about themselves, but about how they might have died. They are very talkative. You just ask them the right questions. My name is Daniel Westcott. I am a professor in the Department of Anthropology at Texas State University, and I am the director of the Forensic Anthropology Center at Texas State. Part of the research that we do is what's called taphonomic research. So taphonomy is everything that happens to a once living organism from the moment it dies until it's discovered. What we do is research on human remains. We're getting much better at understanding the first weeks or two weeks after death. We got him. So there's a couple things that, that we can look at here. When the body is decomposing, you get a lot of nitrogen out of it, and it'll actually kill off the, all the vegetation. So we get this really dark stain around the body, and we can find these for years after the body's even gone. Um, but the, other thing the driving force behind it was to assist law enforcement or other investigators in uh, interpreting crime scenes. How long have they been dead? What happened at that scene? How do you find missing individuals, clandestine remains? Since we're doing decomposition research, we will have bodies that are laying on the surface. We are getting individuals that wanted to donate their bodies. This is important for us for a couple reasons. One is, is that we know that the people that are donating to us know what will happen to them. The other thing is, is by doing this, we have lots of information about that individual. How much they weigh, what they did throughout life, you know, where they live, you have information about diseases they had, all that kind of stuff. You're getting much better to get that information from a living donor than you would a next to kin donation. We have received a little over 900 individuals, and we have about 2,000 individuals that are pre-registered. But we've expanded a lot. Our skeletal collection has grown, which allows us to do a lot of research. We can do high-resolution CT scans, for example, that you would never be able to do on a living person. to look at disease patterns. We can start addressing questions that we have about archeological sites. Isotope analysis, which allows us to look at where did the person come from? Those are kind of information that we can have that can be applied to a lot of things, including forensic cases. We're investigating a new method of diagnosing cancer. What's interesting with this collection is that they're from bodies of donors. So we have the information of cause of death, uh, the primary cancer that the person had, all of this. And it's also been operating for a while now, so they have a lot of donors, so there's more chances of having a significant sample. It's really like the best <laughs> that I could have hoped for. When I first started in forensic anthropology, most of what forensic anthropologists did was aid in the identification of individuals. So all those kind of questions change over time, but in reality, we're still at the very beginning. So we're getting better information, but we still, there's a long ways to know. I'll be asking the same questions long after I'm part of the skeletal collection. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe for more from Austin Insight. You can also watch full episodes of Austin Insight for free on the PBS app.